I'm Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. An unexpected result from a controversial driver's license law signs it may be helping people who are waiting for organ donations. For the first time, black and Chicano students at San Diego City College will host a joint forum on police and border patrol brutality. I'm Peggy Pico with how the students changed the school's curriculum. Then, after almost four decades, bilingual paper La Prensa gets a new publisher. Our conversation about his political background and the paper's future. These girls are fantastic. I lift that lid up and those girls are solid across there and they're making honey and they're making babies. Saving the bees, the unconventional remedy scientists are buzzing about and how it may help bees live longer. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Crime is at a record low in San Diego County, but a new report out today shows gang affiliation is holding steady. KPBS reporter Megan Burks has this update. Sandag surveyed individuals booked into county jail last year and found a quarter of adult arrestees were currently or previously affiliated with a gang and 43 percent of arrested youth were affiliate, affiliated. That's an increase for adults and a slight decrease for youth when compared to 2008 when the county started the survey. Lead researcher Cynthia Burke says more work needs to be done to provide alternatives to gang-involved youth. Many of the youth do want to get out or they see themselves getting out. And how do you help that transition from a criminally affiliated lifestyle to not? And I think that there's still a gap in those services. I think stakeholders are aware of this, but sometimes there's competing priorities and there might be limited resources to do everything we want to do. In 2013, the city of Vista began doing intervention work in elementary schools, and San Diego's Gang Commission supports a three-pronged approach of prevention, intervention, and suppression. It's currently exploring adding to the city payroll former gang members to help police reach those already steeped in gang culture. Megan Burks, KPBS News. The torrential rains and devastating mud flows that hit north of Los Angeles may be a sign of El Nino's coming wrath in San Diego County. Nearly 200 drivers were trapped Friday on Highway 58 in up to 20 feet of mud and debris. Emergency officials say a similar scenario could happen here this winter. San Diego Flood Control is preparing for El Nino's predicted downpours, clearing flood channels, cleaning storm drains, and repairing dams. They're also keeping a close eye on low water crossings and rivers using a system of weather monitors. We have a network of automated rain gauges, weather stations, um, stream gauges, lake level stations in the county. And uh, this information arrives in real time during storm events. The county has uh, webcams for monitoring flood prone streets. The most vulnerable areas are those hillsides burned in last May's wildfires. A backing from business, the White House says 81 U.S. companies have signed an agreement to bolster the administration's international climate change proposal. It's a promise to take steps to reduce their own carbon emissions. We have now doubled our production of clean energy. We've been reducing our carbon footprint even as the economy grows. Uh, and this progress isn't just creating a safer planet. Uh, it's also creating jobs. It's creating business opportunities. Uh, and it's something that customers are increasingly looking for. The companies signed on include Intel, Coca-Cola, Google, and Walmart. The news comes ahead of final negotiations next month on an, inter on an international climate change agreement in Paris. Saving lives with changes to a new driver's license law in California, the Sacramento Bee says... State organ and tissue donor numbers increased by more than 30 percent this year. The DMV says the surge may be linked to the passing of AB 60. The law granted driver's licenses to more than half a million people who are living in the country illegally. The law went into effect in January. All eyes on Los Angeles as the NFL conducts public hearings later this month. San Diego Chargers rejected a proposal for a new stadium in Mission Valley. The public meeting will take place on October 28th at the Spreckles Theater downtown. NFL says 
It's a chance for fans and others to express their views on potentially relocating the Chargers to L.A. San Diego and Oakland are requesting a move to Carson to share a joint-use stadium. The commissioner's executive staff will be at the hearing to listen and answer questions before any decisions are made. Similar hearings, by the way, are planned in St. Louis and Oakland. A slip and slide at the Valley View Casino Sports Arena. The Lakers and Golden State Warriors preseason basketball game was cut short Saturday due to moisture on the court, causing players to slip. Officials stopped the game during the third quarter to avoid injuries. Attendees can receive full refunds at sale locations. Black and Chicano students at City College have joined together to fight injustice. Peggy Pico talks with student activists about their efforts on campus and beyond. Student activists organized a protest last fall to voice opposition to police and Border Patrol brutality. That led to a student faculty development of a new combined Black Chicano history class. And their first forum being held this Wednesday called SD Police, Border Patrol in Our Community, Breaking the Borders. Joining me are San Diego City College students Joni Lopez, president of the school's National Chicano Student Group, and Mecha, and Aaron Harvey, co-founder of the student group Justice for SD33. And Joni, how are issues of equality different for black and Chicanos? I would say um, the fact that we have immigration, um, a, lo a lot of immigration happening with the Latino community, also language barriers, but we share a lot in common. We have, um, you know, we're minority, we get discriminated, we get um, racial profiled all the time. And uh, speaking of which, Erin, um, you were charged under the anti-gang conspiracy laws. How does that law affect both blacks and Latinos? Well, in order to be eligible for this law, the Penal Code 182.5, you have to be documented as a gang member. And in San Diego County, um, I believe we have 3,700 Latinos documented as gang members and 1,700 blacks documented as gang members. So if they wanted to uh, start applying this law, uh, to everyone, it would actually affect the Latino community uh, uh, more than the black community. Um, we talk. We talked a little bit about at the beginning this this inequality differences, which seem minor compared to the big picture. And I'll start with you, Erin. There seems to have been in the past a reluctant a reluctance for Latinos and blacks to maybe work together on the same issues. Do you find that to be true? And if so, why do you think that oh, yeah. is? Most definitely. Um, well. Any time you have uh, two individuals who have been deprived of, of, of whether it be resources or anything, then a lot of times they end up fighting amongst each other for the scraps. Um, when we, we need to understand that our, our liberation is tied into one another, um, that we're both being oppressed and we're both being incarcerated at the same rates, um, and that we need to find ways to work together um, in order for both of our people to be liberated. And you're nodding your head yeah. on that, Joni. Do you want to add to that? Um, we need to get together because we, we share same common grounds. And so for, in, for, in order to move forward, we need a, a stronger force. That's so, how you so get the unification. The unification, then. right. Well, I know you're in the uh, new Black Chicano history class. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, why do you think that course is beneficial? How is it helping you? Man, we're learning the black perspective and the Chicano perspective at the same time. And we're having discussions that we wish to have a three hour <laughs> class instead. Um, but we're learning that we have the history, present and past are parallel to one another. And the fact that we have this class and um, that we get to share our something that you don't hear out or you don't read in, in high school books, for example. Right, you don't he hear that sort of parallel no, path. You and you don't hear the same perspective. And the fact that we're learning two perspectives and we're finally having a discussion, we're like, okay, we're ready. What's next? What's gonna happen? Now, Erin, you're uh, one of the speakers at Wednesday's forum on police and border patrol brutality addressing that issue in San Diego. What are some of the key topics of discussion for that forum? Uh, well, for me, I'm going to be talking more on solidarity. Um, so we, we, we must unify, and we, mo and we have to understand that our identities are the same. And that's where, where the, the class is so important, is because you have two populations of people who don't know where they came from. So therefore, you don't know where you're going. So at, at, at the seminar tomorrow, again, we're going to be talking about the similarities of our past, 
um, how immigration and mass incarceration mm -hmm. are both tied into one another. Um, and that, again, like we're, we're both being affected by the same thing, so there's no point of us fighting to, uh, against each other. We, we need to unify. And I'll have to end on this, Joni. What's the response been um, so far since this class has started and sort of this unified approach that, hey, we're all in the same place here? Well, as president of Mecha, I have 35 students that are coming um, outside of the classrooms to um, be part of clubs. And also, I'm also part of Pillars of the Community and also on um, social justice coalition. So we are having Chicanos, we're having black students, um, including um, other, other, other ethnicities coming together and we're uh, finally organizing to create something. All right, Joni Lopez and Aaron Harvey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a food fight on Capitol Hill. Movers and shakers in the food and agriculture industries facing off against organic farmers and consumer groups. Associated Press reporter Tracy Brown says it's all about food labels. There's no middle ground in the debate over genetically modified foods. There's maybe a romantic idea of agriculture the way it was done 100 years ago as being the, the thought of that's the way farmers should do agriculture today. And I think that's not realistic. From the farm to the house floor. Fact is... The scientific consensus on the safety of genetically engineered products is utterly overwhelming. What's the problem with letting consumers know what they're buying? The arguments pit the largest players in the nation's food and agriculture industries against organic farmers and some consumer groups. In my world, and what I believe is the right thing to do for food security, for feeding people, for the health of the environment, and for our own health, uh, genetic engineering is not part of that picture. The Food and Drug Administration already regulates food from genetically engineered plants to ensure that they are safe to eat and doesn't require labeling. In a rare behind-the-scenes tour at the agricultural biotech company Monsanto, experts explained how genetically modified seeds are engineered to have certain traits such as resistance to some herbicides or tolerance to drought conditions. The, the reality is farmers need tools. They need better seed, they need tools to help manage pests, and the planet's growing, the climate is getting more challenging, and so then the question gets down to what kind of tools do farmers need in order to feed a growing planet. The majority of the country's corn and soybean crop is already now genetically modified. Agribusinesses worry mandatory labels will spook consumers. But labeling proponents say there's still too much that's unknown about GMOs. One factor that's driving customers to seek out organic foods. We grow what we grow because we know it sells at market. The fact that we're growing means that people are, people are getting into this pretty well. Next summer, Vermont stands to be the first state to enact a law requiring labels on foods that contain GMOs, unless the bill pending in the Senate passes. As currently written, that law will stop Vermont's labeling and prevent other states from following suit. Tracy Brown, Associated Press, St. Louis. Two scientists team up to save the honeybee from colony collapse disorder. They're investigating an unconventional remedy, the mushroom. EarthFix reporter Ken Christensen takes a look at how it may help reduce viruses in bee colonies. <laughs> Wow, very nice. These girls are fantastic. I lift that lid up and those girls are solid across there and they're making honey and they're making babies. Eric Olson owns more colonies than any beekeeper in Washington State. Hot dog. There's nothing greater than to open a beehive and see them doing well. They're doing well today. Look at that. I'm really tickled with this. But just months ago, he opened his hives and discovered nearly half his bees were dead. I spent 20 years as a pilot in the Air Force in my share of combat situations, and I never was as low as I was when all those bees were dead. That's the lowest time of my life. It turns out this may be the new normal. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says that nearly half of colonies across the country died in the 2014 season. Big losses have been happening for years, and scientists haven't pinpointed what's causing them. 
They say more than 60 factors may play a role in collapsing colonies. Factors like pesticides, malnutrition, and loss of habitat. If we don't find some answer, I am really concerned about whether these little girls will survive. But one unlikely solution may be growing close by, in the forests of western Washington. Oh, there's another one. Enter Paul Stamets. He's a pioneer in the study of mushrooms. This is a beautiful specimen. The white margin here means it's growing really well. It's what I call happy mushrooms. Makes me a happy person, too. I'm involved in the study of fungi ever since a very young age. My initial interest was magic mushrooms, and then I got into edible mushrooms and medicinal mushrooms, and my mother was much happier. <laughs> Stamets scours the forest for rare types of fungi. I use mycology and the use of fungi to help clean up the environment, improve the immune system of animals, and I began to think. We've gone to the moon, we've gone to Mars, and we don't know the way of the bee. All right. You know, I bet you I can do something to help the bees. Stamets recently discovered a mushroom that might be able to take on one of the honeybee's worst enemies. And that's called the Varroa mite, with the, the name Varroa destructor. Varroa mites began wreaking havoc on U.S. beehives in 1996. We lost about half the colonies east of the Mississippi over that winter. Steve Shepard is an entomologist at Washington State University. He spent decades trying to understand how Varroa mites cripple honeybees. He says they invade hives and attach themselves to infant bees. I always think of it as having something about the size of a pancake feeding on you. They live off bee blood and transmit a slew of viruses to their hosts. The sickly bees lose the ability to fly and gather food for the hive. Many end up dying prematurely. They'll kill the colony within a couple of years unless beekeepers intervene. <laughs> That's why Shepard decided to try a new approach. Something doesn't look quite right with it. Yeah, it'll never fly. He teamed up with Paul Stamets. Stamets told him about a type of fungus that's highly attractive and highly lethal to termites. Shepard wondered what this termite-killing mushroom extract would do to the varroa mite. So we should uh, do something with this, yeah. huh? Ready? He recently started testing the product on bees in his lab. So we take bees from colonies with high mite levels. We set up numerous cages, some with fungus. They're finding that the product is killing mites without harming bees. It's certainly uh, it's encouraging so far. And that's not all that mushrooms can do for bees. Bees have immune systems, just like we do and these mushrooms. They're like miniature pharmaceutical factories. Their initial results show that certain forest mushrooms can reduce viruses in bees and help them live longer. I think I've discovered now that the fungi that are rotting the logs are absolutely critical for the immunological health of the bees. This is a really interesting potential breakthrough in understanding how nature works and how we co-evolve with fungi. Shepard and Stamets plan to expand both experiments by partnering with commercial beekeepers. Eric Olson was the first to sign up. I don't have too much hair left. Uh, I have pulled my hair out. We just can't seem to get a control on the Varroa mite. We've got our fingers crossed. The future of Western honeybee colonies and the billions of dollars of crops they pollinate may depend on it. Reporter Ken Christensen of EarthFix, an environmental reporting project made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Following up now on San Diego's bilingual newspaper La Prensa, the paper is changing hands after nearly 40 years. Peggy Pico talks with the new publisher of the weekly paper about its history and future. 
Daniel Munoz founded La Prensa, the region's first Spanish-English paper in 1976 during turbulent times in the Latino community. For the past 39 years, the Munoz family ran the paper. Now my guest, businessman and former political consultant Art Castaneras is the paper's new publisher. And Art, briefly walk us through the paper's history. Sure. It was started in the, in the mid-70s as a newsletter. And it was back when there were no Latino outlets and there wasn't a Spanish language TV station here in town. And they started it more to influence and to educate the Latino community in politics. The upcoming elections, important civic issues that were going on. And it was in December of 76 that it came out as a real newspaper. A weekly paper. A weekly Friday paper. And, and what's it like today? How much of it is in English and how much of it is in Spanish? Our mix is about 60-40 English to Spanish, and uh, we have uh, articles that are written exclusively in Spanish, and some of them are, are covered in both languages. Uh, we have an internal Spanish front page, and uh, so it's about 60-40, sometimes a little bit more English than Spanish. And uh, what's your vision for the paper? Well, you know, it's different. I've spent the last 25 years in politics, working both for the California State Legislature and then after that as a political consultant, and I've worked on over 70 campaigns. I've worked with the media from the outside in, trying to get them to cover some of these stories. And now I have the privilege of being on the other side. And so in order to do that, I retired from running campaigns. I didn't think it was fair or, or ethical to be running campaigns and then also cover those stories. Sure, and, and that was my question. <laughs> Dozens of political campaigns, as you said, Gray Davis, Ben Hueso, Cheryl Cox, most recently. So how do you ensure that your political ideology and this, this really rich past that you've had doesn't actually slip into the paper's news coverage? Well, you know, I, I try to be non-biased. I try to run the stories based on the issues that are going on. And uh, it, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be my commitment not to misuse the, the privilege of the media. Uh, that, that I now have in a in a way that's slanted. Will you be working with an editor to help with that? Yes, well, we have an editor coming in. He's uh, he'll be here in about two weeks. He's currently on a, works for a different uh, uh, outlet, mm -hmm. so I can't announce who it is. But it's somebody that, that you know, and uh, it's somebody with a journalistic background who has been an editor of a paper, and our art director is somebody who used to run some local papers in Orange County. So there are some some real journalists involved, but this paper wasn't founded by journalists. Uh, Dan Munoz Sr. and Dan Munoz Jr. We're community activists. And so what I bring to the table as a publisher is my background of 26 years of politics and business. This is really a business. Um, and what our business is, is having enough advertisers to be able to put our paper out every week. And the content is something that can educate the community. And at the end of the day, the only two currencies that a community has is either economic clout or political clout. And I think both of these can be exercised through a newspaper. How do you explain, uh, how, do you, how do you plan to expand the paper? Well, we currently deploy the paper from San Ysidro all the way to Escondido, to Oceanside. It's a county-wide paper. Uh, large communities in Oceanside and in uh, Vista, San Marcos areas as well. And so we're going to expand it not only in print, but also a huge Internet presence. Uh, we're developing our own custom phone app so people can download it and then get, get fed information as news are, is breaking. We only publish on Fridays, so sometimes there are things that happen on Monday, and we, don't have, we have to wait four days in order to get it out. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a lot bigger presence online than in print. And in, in, on both, are you going to have a column, an either online column or in the paper? Yeah, I already do. I, I have a small column on page two that's sort of an insider column. And then there's an article that I write that's in place of an editorial. We call it a perspective piece. And I write about different things. I wrote last week about how there are no Latinos starring in, on, 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 on uh, TV shows. There were more in the 70s, 80s, and 90s mm. than there are today. And uh, three weeks ago, I wrote about the, um, the Kentucky clerk who wouldn't sign the marriage certificate for same-sex couples. And what that piece was about was about the rule of law, where it happens to be that this elected official is, is discriminated against same-sex marriages, but it could just as easily be Latinos. Let me ask you this. With all the Spanish language news, though, available, and there's quite a bit now compared to when the, uh, the paper started in the 70s, why does our region still need a bilingual newspaper? You know, some of these stories are so... Um, small in nature. So it's about neighborhoods or about a school district or about something that most of the general media just don't cover. And so when I saw that uh, Warren Buffett bought a whole stable of local weekly and, and daily papers, and uh, just last week Gannett bought $280 million worth of weekly and local papers, I think there are niche papers in niche communities or in communities of interest that are still very powerful. I, I wouldn't want to have a general circulation paper like the UT, I think mm -hmm. those are hard to manage. But when you have a uh, more of a finite audience, I think they're still very powerful. All right. La Prensa publisher, Art Castaneras, thank you so much. Thank you, Peggy.
Remembering Mr. Padre, a dedication today to honor the famed San Diego right fielder and father. Tony Gwynn's baseball career, legendary. He played for the Padres and San Diego State, now Interstate 15 from Scripps Poway Parkway to Camino del Norte has been named Tony Gwynn Memorial Freeway. This stretch of road is special for his son, too. For, my, for me, myself, go, going to the field with my dad, you know, during the summertime, that was the route we took. It's not the only roadway name for the former slugger. A street outside Petco Park is named for the late Tony Gwynn. It's Tony Gwynn Drive. A low pressure system will keep the weather cool with a chance for some showers in the desert, then a slight warm up later in the week for San Diego. We're looking at 70s along the coast over the next few days, 70s and 80s in the inland valleys with comfortable sleeping weather, and 60s and 70s if you're in the mountain areas, a chance for, as I mentioned, some rain in the desert tomorrow. Temperatures there back into the 80s. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom on Morning Edition. Skipping out on medical treatment behind bars. The practice leaving inmates making a choice between their health and limited resources. That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.